jet-lagged the hills, but he's back at Sleepy Hollow organizing a golf day today. <laughs> he's David Young. David, I hope you're well. Thanks for joining. How are you doing? We're doing great. We had a great week over in Scotland and, you know, trying to get our East Coast time, you know, back under our, our belts and, you know, full swing here at Sleepy. No rest here at Sleepy. I was about to say, uh, Sleepy Hollow is not the appropriate moniker because you guys are going 10 to the dozen, especially... I mean, you just got back just, what, a mere 12, maybe a little bit more hours ago from Scotland? Yeah, we got back about a day ago after about a 17-hour trip, and you know, we've got a full-field uh, charity outing out here today, which is a really nice cause, and unfortunately, some thunderstorms blew through a little while ago, so we're, uh, we've got them back in right now, getting ready to send them back out, so, uh, you know, quite a full day here at Sleepy, as most days are. And I appreciate you for taking time out, folks. That is who David Young is. I came to know David just as a backstory to this, and I'll let you t tell me more. My parents, Johan and June, lived just down the way from you guys in Orlando, where you had your summer home, and they got to know you. And my dad's like, I met um, David and his wife, and they've got a son, a son, Cameron, who goes to Wake Forest, and he's good. And next thing, Cameron Young is winning on the Corn Ferry Tour and now nearly on the PGA Tour. So we'll get to that before we get to know you some more uh please kind of tell us how you came to where you are oh boy i mean my first job out of college was working here at sleepy hollow in the in the bag room you know i got out of school with an aerospace engineering degree and really cleaning clubs here in the bag room at sleepy hollow uh -huh. uh, my parents were thrilled but uh you know that was the, that was the career i wanted to pursue and here we are you know almost gosh almost 40 years later, um, you know, still here at Sleepy after a couple of stops in between at other places, but back here where I started as the director of golf and, uh, you know, couldn't be happier. It's been a great run here at Sleepy and, you know, it's the kind of place that affords me to do all of the things, um, you know, a professional golfer would like to do. I, you know, I've had a chance to play competitively in the area. You know, we have a great teaching club fitting program, you know, a very active instruction program, very active tournament program here at the club so you know all the things a club professional would like to do uh, you know i've had the opportunity to do here you know at a really high level you're playing at koi as i would expect you know from my brief interaction with you you're always very humble and i can see that in your son um first off let's get back to college and you aerospace engineering aeronautical engineering uh, and and then you you come to golf or were you playing golf in college tell us a bit about that you know, I, I played golf my senior year after I decided I was going to pursue a career as a golf professional um, and not as, as an aerospace engineer. As, you know, I went to school planning on designing, you know, the next generation of fighter jets and all that stuff. And <laughs> until I discovered exactly what that entailed and it, it really wasn't for me. So um, I decided to be, a, you know, I was, I was a decent player, but not the kind of player who was going to make a living playing. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed helping other people with their game and, uh, you know, admired some of the PGA professionals that I knew growing up as a kid um, that I worked for, took lessons from, and decided that was a career I wanted to pursue. So when I got out of college, I went straight to that. I never did work as an engineer anywhere. Well, look, I guess in a funny sort of a way, there is some sort of a aerodynamical sort of relationship between fighter jets and the way your son hits a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> but, but more to that in a second. Um, so you're the director of golf head professional you have a son cameron i i want for the player the parents listening to this who who kind of think maybe they've got a talented kid or whatever and you have been his longtime coach obviously dad i want you to speak about helping a young cameron navigate you sort of the the young years getting into golf and and how you just shepherd a, a young boy or a young girl through that yeah i think you know, the biggest thing we did is we made it available to him we never Push, you know, it's a hard enough game. You know, you have to want to do it. If if you don't want to do it, you know, it's just too much to ask of a, of a young person to to work that hard at a game that can be this frustrating. If it's not a passion of theirs, you know, if it's, it needs to be their passion, not your passion. So I think you know, the best thing we did is we made golf. You know, just by default with my job, he, golf was very available to him. You know, and he and he played golf all his life. Um, you know, we had some other sports he probably enjoyed more baseball and hockey okay so, you know eventually as he became a high schooler you know golf became the main focus of his of his athletics uh, you know and he, and he did have a talent for it so it was it was pretty easy he started playing competitively 
you know, when he was 10 or 11, mm -hmm. but didn't really, you know, work that hard at it till he became a, a high schooler. I have two follow-ups to that. Um, I, I read a quip somewhere where you spoke about um, his playing of ice hockey or hockey for the ice hockey for the folks abroad, hockey for the folks in the States, and how that built a strong leg action out of him. But first, I want to back up and say, you say you made it available to him. Now, as a lover of golf, a guy who's played the game at a pretty high level, a director of golf, a golf professional, I'm interested in, in, in that internal battle for a dad who's a pro and a youngster who clearly is decent just to kind of let him be a little bit. I mean, that couldn't have been that easy just to sort of step aside and let him find it for himself, right? Um, you know, for, for me, it wasn't that hard. Uh, you know, he, he loved to play hockey, ice hockey. He loved to play baseball. Uh, he played a little bit of some other sports. You know, and as a dad, I... I had fun watching him have fun playing whatever he was playing and you know he seemed to get a little more joy probably out of some of the other games um you know than golf at an early age so it wasn't hard to watch him play those and in, in lieu of golf but we did you know we did play a lot of golf in the evenings out here and i did get to see him on a pretty regular basis and we had some chipping contests at night or putting contests and um you know so we played enough golf that i was never um you know, worried that he wasn't going to become at least a good enough golfer to enjoy the game for his whole life. Okay. And if he didn't play competitively for a living. Um, but yeah, I think like most dads just want to see your kids enjoying themselves, having fun, having some success at whatever it is that they have a passion for. And did you, while you were having these chipping contests and nine hole games or just playing or whatever, did you resist the urge to become golf professional and kind of help him along? Or were you just out there, dad, having some fun? Um, you know, I think, yeah, I think for the most part, it was pretty good. I think if I did anything well with Cameron, it was kind of, you know, leaving him alone enough to discover some things on his own without, you know, forcing anything down his, down his throat. I think, you know, as a young, as a very youngster, you know, he, he, he moved around a lot, his feet moved, his legs moved a lot, his, you know, but he generated a lot of speed doing it. So we sort of let him be to see where that would lead. Mm -hmm. uh, with some of his technique and in, in chipping and pitching uh, he got pretty good at it with maybe some less than textbook technique but you know that stuff we cleaned up a little bit later and got a little bit neater with but i think it, it helped develop a sort of a natural athletic ability in those areas that he might not have had if we'd have gotten too technical too soon do you feel i mean you've said so i'm just going to ask the question for the record i guess you know with the baseball and the hockey and stuff um, you felt like the development of the athlete was paramount to the development of the golfer, I assume, right? You know, it certainly was for Cam. I don't know if that's for everybody, but I think if you've got an athlete that's, you know, going to be capable of playing the golf, playing golf or any other sport at a professional level, I think they have to be um, a good natural athlete to begin with. So I think for those kind of people, that's probably the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some folks that are less athletic, um, might need the technical stuff sooner to to make their form, you know, good enough to to play better. But I think if you do have a good athlete, certain one is good enough to play any sport at a professional level. That um, you know, letting that go first and then cleaning up some of the technical stuff later for me, anyway, was a no brainer. Um, I now sort of advancing into the high school years when you started to play some competition and stuff. I was sent a video by a gentleman named AJ Valpil, who now works for Municipal Apparel. He covered the Met section for the longest time. You probably know AJ, a uh, New Yorker. And he sent me a video when I was talking glowingly after following Cameron in one or other event. And he sent me a video going, check this out. And it was Cameron playing in some Met section junior tournament. And it was a tee shot that he was hitting. And his golf swing then, I don't know what age he was, didn't have that sort of characteristic pause at the top of the swing. It was a lot more back and through. You could see generated speed. So I'm keen for your insight on that because is that just him discovering and found out what worked with a pause eventually? Or was that something that was recommended? Um, your comments, please. Yeah, that was something that happened somewhat, um, not intentionally, but as an effect of him trying to clean up some of the rerouting you know in transition from from back to forward up there at the top of the swing he got um 
and he just wanted to neaten it up and, and make sure the club was tracking back and forth without a whole lot of rerouting and it, and it just developed into being a little bit careful up there and and actually you know trying to feel like it went back and came down pretty close to the same path and plane um, so i think that's what led to the little pause up there and it, it's you know for a while in college it got a little too long for my taste so we worked on getting rid of it a little bit um so certainly you know, it's not as noticeable to me these days. As, you know, it's obviously still there and everybody notices it, but mm -hmm. um, really nothing we ever intentionally built into the swing. It just was a result of really trying to be neat so that he knew where that club was coming from on the way down. You know what I love? I mean, this is one now, not an interviewer talking to a guest. This is one golf instructor just talking with another. And I love the fact once again, and I, I sort of see this thread weaving through the whole thing where you're like, there's some discovery on the go. So you likely said to him, hey, we need to tighten up the change of direction. So he was like, mm, okay, fine. If I just slow things down up there, it allows me to do that. Uh, is that the thinking really? It really is. You know, he, he, he's, you know, he, we still work at that. There's, there's, you know, a, a give and take between, you know, you know, what maybe looks or work, looks like it would work best technically, which is sort of where I come in. Mm -hmm. uh, then it has to feel good and be repeatable for him. So, uh, you know, there's, there is a definitely give and take, you know, we'll try a couple of things and he'll find one thing that works um, better for him than some of the others that might, this might look nicer to me, but doesn't feel as good to him. So yeah. there's definitely a, a, a process of, you know, you know, what do we need to accomplish? You know, how we might we accomplish that there might be two or three ways and then it'll take a little bit of experimentation, experimentation to see which feels and works the best of those things so you know it's definitely a it's a neat process we have where he tinkers and feels and you know says dad you know this feels really good and it seems to be working is, is that technically sound or is it something we shouldn't be doing and, and that's kind of been the process for the last few years where he really kind of discovers some things on his own um you know I but we want at the same time that technically sound and they will hold up i must add to this um i've talked with colin marikawa on this very show I've talked with Rick Sessinghaus, who's his longtime coach, also taught him from when he was young, sort of similar to your and Cameron's relationship. And Colin is a very wise young man. Now, I've never talked with Cameron at length, but Colin spoke of self-discovery. And then Rick Sessinghaus basically said, just like you did, I pitched the concept to him saying, this is why it's necessary. This is ways, not a way. It's these are ways to go about respecting this. And then Colin would go into what they call a period of self-discovery. And to me, it just seems like, and it seems like with Cam too, they take ownership of the concept so much. And so I'm saying this and I want your comment because I feel like everybody listening could really glean and likely improve from adopting that stance when they work on their, their games. Yeah, I, I think so. And especially, you know, with Cam and, and Colin, you know, you've got two pretty bright kids that have a, a a good grasp and good understanding of their, their swings and their games so that, you know, that makes that whole process a lot easier when they understand to begin with, you know, why they're doing what they're doing and, and what certain changes, what effect that may have, you know, on their ball flight or, or on their, you know, their, their swing and their mechanics. So, yeah, I think having students that understand their swing so well, um, you know, it makes that process of explaining you know, what and why something might need to happen. Um, and they're a little bit quicker to come up with some things, you know, along with you that, that might help that, that, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll see one thing in Cam, well, you know, this week was a great example. We were close to the end of our practice round on Wednesday over at St. Andrews and Cam hit a few wayward shots. And I, I thought I saw, you know, what might've been causing that. And I gave him a suggestion that actually just felt terrible to him and, and didn't help me. Uh, we had lunch and we talked a little bit about it and he went back out after lunch and said well I think I could accomplish the same thing but you know doing this little something a little different a little bit sooner in the backswing um, you know and it, and it clicked and it worked and he, and he had a great week so um, it does help to have students that are you know astute and, and aware of how and why their swing works for them uh, when it comes to that process. That is such a cool story too because to encapsulate this for the listener and then I'll let you put a bow on it. 
because you've spoken about when he was in college, things got a bit long and the pause maybe got too long and you're like, that wasn't my taste, but it worked for him. So it seems to be me like you going for the results in terms of the ball flight or whatever over the aesthetics every single time. And that's why there's this give and take. And I feel like for everyone listening, you know, everyone's got their iPhone out there on themselves all the time and they're trying to copy the pause like Cameron Young. But if it's not working, it's time to ditch that idea because it's not worthwhile. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I think that, that's for sure. It, it feels like I don't think we've ever in any aspect of the game made a change in his swing solely because it would look nicer. You know, it always had to have, you know, a measurable effect on, on the outcome. So, you know, we never, ever did anything just to make a swing look nicer or conform or, you know, or, or match anybody else. It was always purely, you know, if we do this, it's going to work for him. And, um, you know, we want it to be mechanically sound, but it doesn't necessarily have to look like anybody else or, or look like a, um, you know, a textbook swing. He's always accepted that pretty well. Well, I find it fascinating how a lot of folks on social media, as he's now becoming a household name, are like, man, I love the way this guy swings it. His rhythm is impeccable. He's powerful. He's got all this stuff. Um, I, I want to back up, just rewind just a little bit quickly to the college years. You know, he's in college, Wake Forest, alongside Will Zalatoris. Then he turns pro. And um, from, from my point of view, I, I, I know that so many young aspirant professionals, life is hard. That's a grind. And, and just to get to perhaps the Corn Ferry Tour was a challenge. And of course, he wins quickly and advances to the tour. I, I want you to advise the listener and the viewer to this. You know, when you're going through those tough times, when it's kind of the learning zone, but you want to get ahead, but there's things to have to accomplish. That's a challenging time. That's such an important part of one's development into the player one is becoming. Yeah, I think to Cam's credit, you know, one of the big, one of the things I love about him is, he, you know, he's all about being, becoming the best player he can be, you know, in the long run. He, he's always willing to work on something, to change something, to make something better, um, even though it might not be the best for tomorrow or the next day or the day after. But looking down the road, you know, even if he had a big tournament coming up, he's always willing to work on something if he thought that was going to be better in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's always had this faith in th the process, right? He understands there's going to be ups and downs and, and, you know, good streaks and bad streaks. And he's, he's gotten much better um, at knowing, you know, that the bad streaks are going to come to an end, you know, you know in college and, and as a junior, sometimes, you know, as soon as you start not playing well, you know, it can feel like it's, you're never, ever going to play well again, which we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's gotten much better you know, through some of those ups and downs. I think they're in the long run. They're really good for you because you realize that that's all they are um, and that nothing's permanent. He's always been willing to sort of trust the process of trying to keep getting better, knowing that when he comes out of that rut or the, or the bad streak, he's going to have another good streak that's you know, going to be even better than he was before. So, yeah. so I think having you know, a process in place, doing the things that you know are going to be best in the long run you know, and be willing to put up with some of the you know, maybe the, you know, the one step back to take two step forward kind of thing. Um, but he's always been very good about that, sticking to that process and having faith that on the other end is, uh, you know, the best golf of his life. Along those lines, uh, you guys were out there. I was on his call final round at Tulsa um, where he didn't get off to the best of starts. He sort of hung around a little bit and then was just kind of slipping along in Will Zalatoris' slipstream. And all of a sudden there on the 15th hole, he's tied for the lead. Then on 16, from the middle of the fairway, made a kind of a scrappy mistake. And yep. ends one shot out of the playoff. Um, now, fast forward a few months, he shows up at St. Andrews, just sort of lurking. You know, it's all about Rory McIlroy, all of a sudden all about Cam Smith. And all of a sudden, Cameron Young <laughs> tries it on the 18th green. And there's a chance to perhaps get into a playoff if things fall his way. I share those because I want your insights for the listeners because that's all great news. And everyone's like, wow, Cameron Young, that's incredible. You know, he's been close, major championships. He's going to win surely. But I know what it's like having a sibling who I've also coached afterwards where they're like, he's a 16 at Tulsa, you know, that evening, what it feels like when you just won out. And then at St. Andrews, I'm sure with you guys Sunday evening when he's just won back and then you start rehashing the round. 
Talk to us a little bit about that shadow side of dealing with, you know, the success, but also that I didn't pull it off sort of a mindset. Yeah, you know, that's, you know, it's, you know, especially, you know, when you miss by one stroke in two majors, obviously there's, you know, you know, the one hand, you know, somewhere deep inside you, you know, that you played really well and you beat, you know, all but one or two guys, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot to be proud of and a lot of positives to take away, but it's you know, human nature to, to sort of beat yourself up a little bit about what might have been had you not done this or that. And, you know, I know at, at Tulsa, particularly Cam felt like, like, yeah, that, you know, the, the double bogey at 16 was glaring um, to the observer, but he felt like he made so many mistakes that week. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, some, some club choices or some, some shot choices during the week, um, you know, really had a lot of opportunities with some short irons and didn't take advantage of them. So in his mind, I don't think it was really the double bogey on 16 that, that cost him there, although that was a bad mistake. But I think he just felt like he had more to learn, you know, all the way around a little bit about, you know, being patient, eliminating some of the silly mistakes where maybe he got a bit too aggressive in spots and, and you know, went for some pins that he shouldn't have and, and, and didn't give himself good looks at birdies. Okay. Um, so I think he looked at it more like, you know, not that any particular one mistake was, was bad, but I think he's gotten used to the feeling that, um, just learning to let it come to him a little bit, maybe know, you know, from experience when to step on the gas, when to let it off a little bit and uh, just make some better choices all the way around the golf course. And, you know, cumulatively, that's the difference, not any one, you know, execution error. All right. And then tell me about Sunday evening at the old course. I mean, what a place, what an experience. I texted you when you were over there and, and I was sort of living vicariously through you guys. And <laughs> as a broadcast guy, I'm not supposed to support people, but I kind of do a little bit. Um, Sunday evening afterwards, was there exhilaration? Was it more of Cam just being kind of cool about things? What was that like? You know, to be honest, it was, it was kind of a, a hectic, um, you know, he had his, he finished 18, he, he, he had his, press conference and he really had to rush straight off to the airport so we really didn't get a whole lot of time uh -huh. with him so it was really about it it was really a day or so later before we actually got to talk about it and um you know he he you know he's disappointed and frustrated not to get a win but i think he realizes his game is going in the right direction you know like you know the two big things on sunday were you know the the, the putt on number one he had a mr four footer for par on the first hole and um you know, he felt like that was just a little was going to have a little bit of break to it and, it and it went the other way, played it inside the edge and it went the other way. Um, Stuff that happens, right? You know, he got, you know, felt like on number nine with the wind against you, you know, he was one of those guys in the field that could get it there if he hit a real good one and a little right to left and just kind of overdid the, the right to left part and got it in the gorse. Um, you know, so, you know, bad time for that. But in 72 holes, I think he said, you know, he, he drove it in one bunker and then drove it in the gorse once. So, you know, put it in place 70 out of 72 times Pretty solid. with that firm ground. So I think we'll take that every time. So while he was disappointed in the execution in a couple of spots, you know, I don't think he had, he didn't question his thought process or his um, choice of shots. I think he just you know, felt like he did a better job there than he did at Tulsa of, of being patient and sort of, playing the right shots and, and, and hoping it would come to him a little bit. And, you know, and then he did play fairly aggressively down the stretch, obviously, you know, hit drivers on mm -hmm. 15, That's... 17, okay. those were all some, some pretty aggressive plays, you know, obviously 18, uh, you know, and, and, you know, almost, almost paid off, but I think he was proud of himself as far as the way he made his decisions and the way he handled himself there uh, versus maybe getting a little aggressive too early at, at, at Tulsa. Okay, two quick follow-ups, and I'll let you know. I know work is calling. Um, I have to ask you about his mental acumen, because to me, he's got such a old, wise head on young shoulders. But making that pressure putt on 18, at or arguably the grandest stage in the game, the 18th hole at St. Andrews, in front of all of those people, I can imagine what it's like for you in the gallery. Um, over 15, 18 feet, whatever it is, what advice would you give to the listener saying, okay, you've got that must make on the final green for whatever it is, you know, the club championship, what keys have you helped your son 
um, apply to be able to pull off something like that because that putt wasn't it wasn't limping in that thing went in with some authority yeah you know, I don't know I could take a whole lot of credit for anything we've taught him you know I think you know we've all you know been out there at night practicing our putting and had you know those practice those big putts you know in our heads for mm -hmm. imaginary titles um, you know he's no different he's done that a million times but I think it's just so I think a little bit that's just inside you I don't know if you can you know, I'm sure, um, you know, some of the great mental coaches that we have, you know, Cam worked a little bit with Bob Rattel in the past and, um, you know, with Jerry Haas at, at Wake. And, you know, so I think some of that can be taught to some degree, but I think for the large part, Cam's just got some of that toughness in him and, and always has where sort of the, the bigger the moment, sort of the, the, the more he can, uh, you know, focus and get determined and, and execute. So I think, you know, I, I think I'd be, um, I'd be wrong if I said that, that there was anything there that I really had to do with that. I think that's for him, it's largely something he has inside of him and you know, just the competitiveness and the desire to, to win and, and the ability to, to sort of focus and, and, and channel some energy into those big moments. <laughs> Humble as always. Um, I need to ask you this because when I have covered him, and when I've watched him play, I mean, I, I still think back, it was burned into the back of my mind. So I'm dispatched Sunday because uh, I've got the penultimate group. It's Cam and Zalatoris. So I'm sent by my producer to the practice facility to just pay attention because, you know, lots of conversation about Will, obviously. He's had runner-ups before and stuff. And so I'm, I'm out there and Will is out there a good hour and a half before mm -hmm. tea time. And I see no carrion. And my boss is like, where's Cameron? I'm like, I haven't seen him, you know? And the next <laughs> thing he sort of eases onto the range, I don't know, inside of an hour from his tea time. And there was a commute to the tee. He hits a few wedges and then a few irons and a few long irons and a few drivers. And he's like, right, that's me. Just seems so relaxed with it. Um, is this also something that's innate or do you have any insights over that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, like you said, it's just finding out what works for you. You know, he, when he warms up before a tournament round, he, he just wants it to be a warm up. He doesn't want to be out there long enough to start experimenting or, or trying to feel something. He just wants to, you know, he's already got a thought in his mind how he wants to swing the club. And you know, he really just wants to warm up and doesn't want to be stuck there hitting balls long enough where, you know, something starts to feel like he needs to try something different. And so, and it's worked for him, you know. I, you know, I think as a coach or as a dad, you know, I'd be maybe a little bit anxious for him to put a little bit longer warm up in. <laughs> but this works for him. And he goes out and he, you know, he, 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 I did manage, you know, I think it was right about Columbus last year, the Corn Ferry Finals, um, where we at least got him to hit some chips and some pitches before his round. Because you know, I think it was important to do that. So, so at least now he, you know, he goes and chips and pitches a little bit. He putts and then you know, does his warm up on the range, which is a relatively quick one. And, you know, and, you know, as a coach, it's hard to argue. He just seems to be working pretty well. He, he's, he's, uh, the guy's, the guy's heart rate looks to me like it's barely moving. I mean, he never shows an ounce of emotion on the golf course. Is he like this off the course too? Yeah, a little bit, you know, I think it kind of runs in the family. I, I, I think, um, <laughs> you know, I think there's probably a lot more under the surface there than, than shows. Um, you know, but he, he does, uh, you know, I think he's, he's, he's very determined, you know, he's got that little fire in his eye and, 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 and in his belly. Um, you know, I know he takes a little bit of heat. Maybe I see, you know, he doesn't read any of the online stuff, but I do. And I know he takes a little bit of heat for not smiling enough out there, not looking like he's having any fun. Um, but he is, he, you know, he's enjoying what he's doing and, but, it, but, you know, so there's more there under the surface, but he does he does uh, a pretty good job of not showing much. I'm just so impressed at the fact that he can control himself the way he does under that pressure. All right, one last insight. This is your your parting shot for the for the listener and the viewer, please. Um, obviously, a highly successful instructor, well respected. You know, dad to a successful you know young golfer. Um, the marching orders for the folks listening, maybe the parents, maybe the the young golfers who want to be a Cameron Young. What would you leave them with, David? Yeah, I think you know, I think I alluded to it before. I, I think you know, if you have you have to set goals, 
you have to come up with a process that you think will get you to those goals, uh, you know, and then stick to it and, and know that there's going to be ups and downs. Uh, there's going to be highs and lows, um, you know, and, and an occasional reevaluation maybe of the goals and the process, but just to stick with it and have faith that uh, on the other end is, is, is better, you know, if not world-class golf, um, but at least your best golf, whatever that might end up being. So I think to me, that's it. I mean, you just have to, you know, you know gather some good information, get some good advice, you know, put a process in place you know, with the appropriate goals and just have faith that if you work through that process, those goals are attainable. Okay. I'm sure a certain, a lot of the listeners and viewers, parents, kids, golfers, um, want to come and get that best information from David Young. Um, so I'll let you share the address first, and then they can look at you um, and go, well, some, we can get advice on how to stay so cool under pressure. Because folks, trust me, when I glance over at family Young on the other side of the ropes, it looks like you're just going for a walk in the park, and I'm so happy for you, and I'm marginally envious too. Um, where can folks find you? Apart from Sleepy Hollow, is there social media, a website? How do they reach out to you, please? Yeah, and... Um... You know, we've got our, our, our Sleepy Hollow website is uh, sleepyhollowcc.org. Uh, some nice information about the club, and uh, you can find my email address there. Um, you know, I don't do much on social media. We're, we're kind of uh, just because I'm not, I don't know much about it yet. Uh, Cam, <laughs> way, just because he's, he's uh, you know, a little bit on the private side personally, but um but uh, right here at Sleepy Hollow, yeah, I'm not that hard to find. So if anybody wants to, that's that's where to find me. Fantastic. I so appreciate your time. I know you're busy. God bless you and your family. And I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And hi to all the, all the Immelmans. We love everybody. <laughs> <laughs>